Thank you for the promotion. So Mary Beth, you can hear me now? I can. Okay, had a couple of little problems, but I made it. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. I don't know why the video is not on. My, my camera thing's on. It's weird. Okay, I'm going to mute it again. Hi, Stephanie. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'll mute myself. <laughs> You're fine. <laughs> Let's see. Do I not have my camera on? I do not. There you are. <laughs> we are um recording and we are also streaming through youtube okay i think i'm online can you guys see me yes okay hi greg hi i was going to well that's right And I didn't see, is everybody here? Uh, let me see, there we go. Okay, so wait a minute. Uh, there's Bonnie. Is, I don't know if I'm seeing everybody. Is, is, okay. is Linda here or is she coming? Um, as far as I know, Linda will be attending. Okay. And I don't think we're, we're just almost at seven o'clock. So, so we'll give I'll, it a couple more minutes. Yeah, then we'll go ahead and get started. Okay, I think Linda kind of joined us later on in the meeting last time as well, if I remember right. Correct. Okay. Hang on just a second. Let me, uh, I might have some updated information. Okay. Okay, you're good. Okay. All set? Yes, sir. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and call the meeting to order. So if we uh, stand and pledge allegiance to the flag. Yes. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay. Definitely going to have wait for Zoom to end, to end that process mine uh, <laughs> so uh we'll have a roll call vote please yes commissioner hogan here commissioner linden here commissioner wilson Gotta unmute yourself gene <laughs> uh chairman obranovich okay here <laughs> And Linda, when she gets here. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you. So first would be uh, ceremonial matters, matters, and we have administrative oath to incoming planning commissioner, 
uh, Stephanie Youngblood. Hi, Stephanie. Welcome to our uh, meetings. So, welcome, uh, Stephanie. Okay. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Hey, Cricket. Cricket, you got to <laughs> unmute yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, ready? There you go. All right, with your hand up, just repeat after me, okay? <laughs> okay, for the, okay, and when I say I, you say your name, all right? Okay. Okay, here it goes. For the Office of Planning Commissioner, I. Stephanie Youngblood. And you, you repeat for the Office of Planning oh. Commissioner too. Okay, I, that's Stephanie okay. Youngblood. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support and defend. That I will support and defend. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. To the Constitution of the United States to the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California and the Constitution of the State of California that I take this obligation freely that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion and that I will well and I will well and faithfully discharge the duties upon which I am about to enter and I, okay. Can you I read that? will, yeah, I'll say it a little close, shorter. And that I will well and faithfully. And I will well and faithfully. Discharge the duties upon which I am about to enter. Discharge the duties about which I am about to enter. Yes. Very good. Thank oh, you. Good, God. <laughs> good job. Thank you. Welcome, Stephanie. We're Welcome, looking Stephanie. forward to having you on board and got lots of work for you. So, thank you. Okay. Uh, the next, the next item, uh, it's not really on the agenda, but it's something that we do. And this is, yes, Mary Beth. Yes. Hi, Greg. I just wanted to say that Linda Kelly is, has joined the meeting. Oh, good. Okay. Hi, Linda. That. Perfect. Um, so anyway, this is a part, it's not on the agenda, but it's one of the aspects of the meeting of the planning commission that we do periodically. That's uh, a moment of maybe sadness or something, because we're going to, uh, bid farewell uh, and have a little presentation for Jean. So Jean, we certainly, there's been so much said about this moment and to, to see you leave and so many people have uh, expressed their sincerest appreciation for all your hard work. And uh, I know myself and I know I speak for others is uh, we won't, can't describe how much we're gonna be, you will be missed and uh, however, you will be missed as being a you know, formal member of the planning commission, but informally, I think you can really be busy and help us a lot. So, and we wanna see you uh, stay on in that, in that aspect. So anyway, uh, you've seen these before. So this is a, uh, uh, it's the planning commission proclamation for Gene. So I'm gonna, I'll read this out. I'm gonna hold this up. I have, I have the text on my computer. And you guys can kind of watch this uh, or listen to this. So uh, it's the Town of uh, Lumen's Planning Commission Proclamation, Gene Wilson. Whereas Gene Wilson was first appointed to the Planning Commission. Can everybody hear me okay? Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. Planning Commission on March 20th, 2001 by Hazel Heinlein. And thereafter reappointed by Rhonda Morales for her remaining term of service through March 23rd, 2021 tonight serving several terms as planning commission vice chairwoman and has always brought forth a detailed, well thought out analysis that was fair to all parties involved, true to the law and defended the interest and well being of all citizens of Loomis. So, so true. And whereas Jean in her service to the town of Loomis for the past 20 years has served on many committees, including the zoning ordinance revision during her first years of service from the county's chart based ordinance, to a new ordinance that met the needs of Loomis residents. And whereas Jean always presented with her every vote, a well thought out summary analysis to support her vote and was always very respectful and professional towards staff, fellow commissioners, citizens and project applicants 
has been a valuable resource with a wealth of knowledge on the history of Loomis. And whereas for the past 20 years, Gene was involved in many projects before the purview uh, of the Planning Commission with particular interest in supporting agriculture, tree preservation, including the needs of the more rural residents, as well as supporting local businesses, schools, and churches. Following are some of the projects Gene was a part of, just to name a few. And looking at that list, it's definitely just a fraction. So Legacy Lane Subdivision, Brace Ranch Estates, Kayla Road Mixed Use Project, Homewood Lumber, Loomis Fire Station Remodeled Twice, Sierra de Montserrat Tree Mitigation Plan, Shadow Palms Apartments, Feathered Nest Home Furnishings, uh, Dominican Sisters Priori, The Orchard Subdivision, Legacy Lane with Nemos Ranch, Aunt Cynthia's Bed and Biscuit, Housing Element Update, Loomis Basin Veterinary Clinic, Heritage Park, Morgan Estates, the Grove Subdivision, Loomis Methodist Church Expansion, Loomis Congregational Church Thrift Store, Monte, Cla Monte Claire Subdivision, Poppy Ridge One and Two Subdivisions, Two Equestrian Centers, The Village of Loomis, and Costco. Wow, that's a lot, Gene. <laughs> so, um, whereas out of the many projects Gene has been involved in, she is the proudest of being a part of saving the Loomis Library, which is now called the Loomis Library and Community Learning Center. And whereas, Jean will continue to serve the town of Loomis during the current general plan update process and has been selected to serve as a volunteer to multiple committees, including housing, land use, including several subcommittees, and conservation and resources, biological and open space, where her institutional knowledge will be uh, extremely beneficial. Now, therefore, it is hereby proclaimed by the Planning Commission of the Town of Loomis that we express our sincere thanks and gratitude to Jean Wilson for the long and dedicated hours of volunteering her unselfish time and effort in our community. Jean has left a footprint on the hearts of all she has touched that will leave uh, an everlasting impression on the citizens of Loomis. Thank you for your dedicated service to the Town of Loomis dated today and signed proudly by me. There you go, Gene. <laughs> I second. There you go. All in favor. <laughs> so, Gene, uh, we'll have this at the office for you uh, to take. And I just want to give everybody a moment. If, if you want to uh, chime in with a, a comment uh, here for a moment or so, you uh, just go right, go ahead, uh, Planning Commissioners. I, uh, and, and town staff, too. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to uh, direct everyone to the tribute in the Loomis News. It was uh, written by Janet Thu about Jean Wilson, and it was really a very good tribute to Jean that I don't want to speak too long, but she could always be counted on to know the material before the commission and make a informed decision. And there's many of us here, and I'm sure everybody picked something different that Gene did well. That's only one of them. Thank you, Gene. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. I, I was privileged to sit next to Gene for, let's see, four, five, six, six years almost, <laughs> which is not very long compared to how long Gene has been on the commission. And I must say she was such a great example of fairness, of always just looking for the best for the town, always just so, so fair in everything she did. And um, just, I so appreciated that. And, and her, like Mike said, always very, very prepared for anything, any little dot that should have been or a T truck cross, she, <laughs> she knew it should have been like that. She was such a perfectionist and such a great mentor being able to sit next to her. And if you ever have seen her take notes, it's, whoa, she's just going crazy out there, you know? So she's amazing. I'm, uh, I don't know if any of us could ever live up to Jean's reputation, but I'm so glad she's staying on and that she's going to help us through the process of all these meetings that are coming up for, you know, updating the general plan. 
and I appreciate her love and attention to making this town of Loomis wonderful and as wonderful as she is. And I'm glad she's still with us and still gonna help us participate in this. Thank you, Jean. Love you to death. <laughs> Linda. I've worked with Jean uh, for the last- Thank you, Linda. I've, I've had the privilege of working with Jean for the last 14 years, um, you know, from a, a, a baby to town employee who didn't know anything um, and walking through the ropes. Um, the biggest thing that strikes me about Jean, and, you know, we all talk about our attention to detail and we talk about how much all this meant to her and her perfectionism. But most importantly, Jean is really an incredible woman. She cares deeply about her community, about her family, about her staff members and anybody who crossed her path. Her path. Um, for those features, Jean, you will always be an inspiration to me. You matter and you always know that you matter as a person to Jean. Um, she'll work on her agendas and she'll work what's important to her, but she never forgets who the people is that she's talking to you and Jean, I've always felt important with you and you make a really big difference and you're gonna be missed. I, uh, I mean, I, I've only been here for four years and so much less than Carol, right? Not quite four years even, I'm like three and a half. But I remember the first time I met you, and I think I told this story before, it was um, after my contract was approved by council and I had to go to Rayleigh's, I'm diabetic. And so I had to go to Rayleigh's and get something to snack on on my way back. And so I met Jean and I ran into Jean in, in Rayleigh's uh, at like, I don't know, 10 o'clock at night or whatever it was when I'm trying to get a snack to go home. And so she like took a minute to like try to help me find a snack uh, at night after sitting through the council meeting like I did. And the fact that you were that um, just generous with your time to like a little thing to help, you know, the new guy who you didn't even know find a snack at Rayleigh's. I really appreciate that. It really says something about your character. Um, so I, I wanted to thank you for that. And then also, I don't think I would have been able to get through half of the stuff that I got through here without having your institutional knowledge and knowing that I could go to you for an honest answer about any kind of a question. And um, I just really appreciate that. So Thank you for all of your help. And I know that you're gonna be busy with uh, committee stuff. Maybe I'll run into Rayleigh's and you can hook me up with a snack again. And this time I'll let you actually, you can buy it for me if you want to. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so uh, I, I, oh, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I, I was really lucky to have worked on Saving the Library with Jean. And I have to say that was the most um, just inspiring experience I've had in my life to date. Um, working with Jean was, you know, just, um, she not only did her due diligence and, you know, was always, you know, thorough with her research, but she was passionate, passionate about, you know, understanding the needs of our community, about serving our community and about thinking of our future generation. And so, I think that experience just, um, you know, will have, it's left a permanent impression on me. And um, as I, I think I've said before, um, I hope you don't mind, but this isn't goodbye for me because I will be reaching out to you even more now that you're not on the planning commission because, you know, I will be able to, to tap into your, you know, just extraordinary knowledge, um, but also just wisdom and insight and experience. And so, Jean, I, um, I'm sad that I won't be sitting on the dais with you, but I, I look forward to working with you so much more, you know, with the library and with, with future projects. So thank you. Well, Jean, do I get- Let me just yeah. take a moment and, and uh, ahead, echo Jean, everybody else's sentiments. Go ahead, um, Jean. We wanna hear from you now. Oh, okay. Well, it's been 20 years and it sure doesn't seem like it. Um, it's basically from one general plan to the next being uh, going on now. And uh, a lot of things, a lot of water under the bridge, a lot of uh, projects, minor land divisions, conditional use permits, um, lot splits and uh, 
all kinds of things that have come through. And I have to say, it has been a real honor and privilege to work with this particular planning commission. I have seen planning commissions that um, do not work as harmoniously as this one did, um, who don't listen to the people as much as this one did. And I know that you're gonna carry on those kinds of things. I think, um, I think back uh, about as we work together, I would say the vast majority of times this commission voted pretty much in tandem. On the times that we did have disagreements, it was, it was very obvious that we honored one another and were always polite and respected each other's uh, position and vote even when we disagreed, which really wasn't all that often. So it has been a real honor to, uh, to be in this kind of group. And I know that you will be um, carrying on that, that same kind of thing. And so I just wanna say thank you to all of you and welcome Stephanie. Thank you all. Thank you, Jean. Well said, Jean. Thank you very much. Okay, well- Chairman Obranovich. Yes, um, I, ha I have a couple of messages in the chats and I'd like to open it up to the attendees of oh, this sure. meeting if, if they would like to make a, a public comment. comment, please raise your hand and I'll let you in. Um, if you'd like to read the comment that you posted, you could do that. Otherwise, if you abstain from that, I will read it for you. Um, yeah. Thank you. Jenny Nisley, your mic is open. Unmute. Okay, I'm going okay. to read Jenny's comment. Um, that's the direction I have here. So Jenny wrote in the chat, Jean has been an amazing asset to the town of Loomis and our community. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to working with you in all things Loomis in the future. Amazing job. Thank you, Jenny. Um, promoting up to panelist, Jan Clark Kretz. You may unmute your mic. Thank you, Mary Beth. Jean, I just can't tell you what an honor it was to serve with you in the Planning Commission for the short amount of time that, that I was there, but you are a huge, huge inspiration to me, and um, I learned so much just watching you and, and you know, seeing how you uh, take on projects and, 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 and look at things, and I am just grateful that you're going to continue on with our general plan subcommittees. And, um, you know, I know that you're looking forward to keeping on working with all of us. And I just wanted to let you know that at least for me in the small amount of time that I work with you, I am an, I'm a huge fan of you. I think you're an incredible woman. You're a wonderful neighbor. And I am, am just it was incredibly proud to serve with you. And so thank you for all those years you served our town and for the years up and coming. Thank you, Jean. Thank you, Jan. Thank you, Jan. Russ Kelly, you may unmute and speak. This is Russ Kelly. Jean, I... Uh... Thank you for all the time that you spent. Uh, we, I, I couldn't say more than everyone has already said. Uh, I do appreciate uh, the time that we spent together uh, on some of those projects that you have listed and uh, appreciate you being my neighbor. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Are there others, Mary Beth? Um, let me <clears throat> verify. No, sir. 
Okay. All right. So we'll uh, close that uh, that item, and um, we'll move along. So next is annual election of commission chairman and vice chairman. So this is a, an an annual ritual, or or however uh, often is necessary, and so is, I guess, uh, for chairman, I'll start out by saying I'm willing to continue on. Is anybody else interested in the position? Because it's, uh, it's, not, it's not a foregone conclusion necessarily that it will be me. So any other interests from other commissioners? Okay, I guess Having not. none, uh, I would like uh, to nominate Greg Abronovich for planning commission chairman. I second. <laughs> okay, roll call vote, please. Yes, we'll go with, uh, let's see, Commissioner Youngblood. Um, aye. <laughs> Commissioner London. Yes. Commissioner Kelly. Aye. Commissioner Hogan. Yes. Chairman Obranovich. Yes. Okay. All right. I guess we're, we're all here for another four years. Um, or maybe some two, whatever. So next, uh, it's on the agenda is just uh, to describe the public comment procedure. Uh, they've got kind of a late, lengthy explanation wait, wait, wait. and suffice it to Great. say, yeah. Okay, we'll start with Chairman Obranovich. Yes. Commissioner London. Do I have to say yes? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you could say no. Either way, you're, you're, you're stuck. <laughs> I guess you could be the lone no. <laughs> I. Okay. But so, thank you. Okay. I haven't uh, missed a meeting that I can remember. <laughs> I want to make a, a public comment, plan zone, California, CEQA, and the role of the planning commission. So, so go ahead, please. Mary Beth, are you going to? Mary Beth? have to quit and come back into Zoom. So Mary Beth, if you'd allow me to do that uh, and then let me in as soon as I uh, restart. Okay. Okay. There you go. Okay. Can you see the presentation? Yes, sir. You let me. Does that work? Uh, good evening, Chairman and, and members of the Commission. Um, we're going to be doing a workshop on planning. Um, this workshop tonight, I would say if you have questions, uh, ask as we go along because there's a... In 1909, 1909 Los Angeles, uh, and in 1926, the famous case of Euclid versus Ambler upholds the constitutional uh, constitutionality of zoning in the United States. And Anders, our history goes from there. Yes. Anders, can you, we're still on the very first page. It is, so hold it, let me. There, there you go, there you go. It's interesting, so, okay, let me. Okay, let's, let's try that and see if this works. Works better. For some reason, I guess presentation mode does not work, so. Okay, California planning, so. In 1927, California passed a law requiring that cities and counties have a master plan. Uh, today, we call that a general plan. And in 1928, California passed, passed a standard city planning enabling act, allowing communities uh, to plan and provide for planning. California, the gen, the, for, in California law, the general plans lay out a jurisdiction's future development plans. And it's through a series of policy statements, goals, objectives, uh, which, uh, are provided in text, and it also includes the land use diagram, which shows the uses uh, in the town, um, you know, on a diagram. And we don't call that a land use map uh, in general plan terminology. It is the land use diagram. Uh, the zoning code has a zoning map, but for land use, it's a diagram. Um, the California law also allows specific plans, which are a special set of development standards that apply to a particular geographic area within the town. At this time, you don't have any specific uh, plans uh, within the town, but that's possible. 
uh, and other planning documents allowed by the law include master plans, area plans, vision plans, uh, but they're not defined in the law. So each community can define what those are. And then zoning provides a detailed land use and design regulation, but it has to be consistent with the general plan. So in all cases, the general plan takes priority. And this graphic shows basically the relationship of the documents that the town can adopt. So the general plan is the uh, primary uh, planning document within the town. Everything flows from that. Everything has to be consistent with it. General plan provides that long-term view of 20 plus years. And the general plan is more general. It is not detailed. It is intended to be that long-term view. Under the general plan, then you have specific plans, area plans, zoning implements of the general plan, and you have various standards, and you can have guidelines. Uh, also within that group of uh, implementing ordinances are subdivision uh, requirements, development permits, use permits, variances, and the capital improvement program for the town. The state law requires consistency between all documents. And so the general plan uh, being the top layer uh, drives what happens with specific, specific plans, master plans, area plans. It also drives a municipal code, also drives the standards and guidelines. And as a planning commission, you're responsible to make sure that as a, as a code comes through or as a project comes through, that they are all consistent uh, amongst themselves and with the general plan. And that is your primary responsibility as a commissioner. The general plan is a constitution uh, for the town and it uh, sets out what will happen in the community for planning and future development. It's a long range vision, at least 20 years and the state requires that you uh, look at updating your general plan at least every 20 years with uh, looking at it every five years to make sure it's current. Um, Personally, I like um, the commissions and the town to look beyond 20 years and try to look at 50 to 100 years and, and what needs to be set in place uh, and, and planned for into the future. Uh, one of the things uh, really simple is looking for bus turnouts so they don't hold up traffic on your smaller streets and making sure there's room for those in the future. And that, that's a long term. Uh, it could be that you never have a bus system or it could be that uh, you do in, in a shorter period than you might believe. The general plan also identifies important community issues and solutions. And this is generally done through the setting sections, which we're engaged in right now is updating the setting sections for your general plan. So it's important to identify those issues and then potential solutions. Um, again, the general plan is a basis for all land use decisions and it promotes community participation. It requires that we do have community participation, uh, which uh, we're doing in the case of this general plan update with posting the information online uh, for a review as we go along and the committee structure. Uh, we just completed one uh, questionnaire uh, survey and we'll be doing more. So all of those things are required uh, as part of the general plan guidelines for your general plan. The general plan also sets the ground rules for uh, all development and actions within the town. And it also sets timelines for implementation measures. So you'll see in the general plan in implementation measures, uh, generally they're going to be uh, ongoing, that you're constantly doing them. They may be short term, which is generally a five year period of time, midterm, which is somewhere between five and 10 years or long term, which is 10 years plus uh, for the schedule for implementing uh, your general plan. General plan timeframes, uh, the, the guidelines, again, 20 year planning horizon with five year updates. Um, the other requirement is you can only do four general plan updates per year. Generally, they're done on a quarterly basis. Uh, we're looking at doing at least one general plan update with the housing element uh, in 2021. Uh, and we're hoping to update the overall general plan in the year 2022. The other requirement is uh, annual progress reports that go to the planning commission, town council. Those generally are submitted in the um, 
in the, the February, March timeframe, and they are to be presented to the state of California uh, Office of Planning and Research by April of each year. And the purpose of the progress reporting is to identify where you have implemented or partially implemented the general plan, uh, anything new that has uh, occurred in the community, and specifically, there are some very specific reporting right now on housing and the accomplishment of your housing goals. State law requires uh, general plan elements of the required elements of the land use, the housing, the circulation, safety, noise, open space, conservation, air quality, and justice. Um, and those are mandated for every town in, in the state. Then there's optional general plans. And so Loomis has decided to have a public services facilities and finance element, but other optional elements that would be, dis uh, be selected by the community would be community character design, uh, public health, economic development, or other community specific topics that are unique and special to uh, the yeah. town. Each element is to contain a setting. Uh, this describes the existing condition. This really becomes a baseline for your general plan and it's important to get it right. Uh, we're getting uh, comments on the setting sections right now, which are being, uh, are very useful. And I know Gene has been extremely useful in providing comments on the setting and, and getting information uh, that is necessary to describe. There's also uh, to be a narrative, uh, vision statement, expectations. Again, uh, these would be things that you may not be able to achieve, but talk about the community. And you do have uh, an overall vision uh, in your existing general plan. And I believe that is being carried forward into the future. Then you have goals and the goals are broad. Um, they're not specific, but these are things that you want to achieve within the planning timeframe. Then objectives begin to tie down the goals uh, for specific objectives that are quantifiable uh, that you want to achieve. Uh, below the objectives are your policies and how you will achieve those objectives through policies of the town. And finally, you have implementation measures. And the implementation measures are quantified and they're scheduled. And the schedule, again, is the short, the um, mid, the long term, or the ongoing measures. Uh, but it's very important to quantify these within the um, annual progress report. Then if we have quantified measures, we could actually re report uh, in that report on how you're achieving those uh, measures. Within the general plan, again, the hierarchy is the vision, the aspirational statements. This is where you want to be. This is what the community uh, desires to be. It provides an image of that community into the future. Uh, and it may be something that you can't achieve right away, but where you want to be. And it should be succinct uh, in describing the community value. And I know we're beginning to put those values together. Uh, they're in the existing general plan, plus with the various um, workshops with Main Street World Program and the committees, uh, we're beginning to describe those values that will be described in the new general plan update. The goals uh, are what is the ideal end? Uh, you may not be able to um, reach those goals immediately, but it, it's what, where you want to be. And the goals are not quantifiable or time dependent because they are to be that abstract look at the future. The objectives are the immediate or achievable steps to achieve those goals and generally quantifiable with achievement desired in a set period of time. Your policy- Excuse me, Andy? Yes. Um, Bonnie has her hand raised, and that was just at the end of the last slide, so. All right, Bonnie. Thank you, and sorry for the interruption, but um, I just wanted to touch upon the vision, and I'm glad that you brought up the Rural Main Street um, technical program that Michelle Reeves um, did a presentation on just a couple of months ago, because I thought she did, you know, an incredible job on capturing some of the challenges our town faces, and and actually having a lack of a coherent or a collective vision seemed to be an overriding issue. And so, um, you know, I was just kind of wondering, is that something that the Rural Main Street program will continue to work with the town on so that 
you know, we can have, you know, this, this quantifiable objective vision um, from town <laughs> met residents because I'm finding when we're doing these um, general plan update committee meetings, you know, we're, we're kind of, you know, bumping into that issue of not having this overriding vision. vision. And so instead, in the committee, we're kind of going down these rabbit holes as to, you know, what each member or participant mm -hmm. might think without an overriding collective shared vision. First of all, um, we'll be using the information that Michelle provided, but her contract uh, has been completed, so we'll be using it. Uh, we still have work from Robert Liberty. In fact, uh, his products uh, based on workshops he's conducted in the community should be available here fairly soon. And then we have uh, Josh, who will be soon conducting some workshops, uh, which are going to be more focused on uh, implementation of um, connectivity within the town. And, and those will be coming up here fairly soon. Um, so we'll be using that information. And, and let me just say with the years of experience in writing these general plans, the committee, the town will be going through rabbit holes. You think you're going to be spinning your wheels, but what's going to be happening as you go through that process is uh, some of these, uh, the vision, the goals uh, will be coming out and becoming clear. And, and what we'll be trying to do is bring that forward to the committees so that you can see uh, where the community is going in achieving those. So that's our role uh, as we work with you in coming to that uh, point. But unfortunately, in updating the agenda plan, there's some rabbit holes to go through and there's some struggling to go through and there's some reiteration to go through uh, before we have that kind of clarity. So just be patient. It, it will happen. It, it will get there. And I, it's always hard to say that at the beginning, but in every general plan I've updated, we get there at the end, but it just, it takes people talking uh, and listening to one another and, and we'll get there. Um, so the policies are specific statements that will guide decision-making and you use policies when you're looking at projects specifically. And it's a rule or a measure uh, that will, uh, is required in establishing the the quality or quantity to fulfill uh, in the project implementation. Then the actions are your implementation measures. Those are actions, they're procedures, they're programs, uh, and they're techniques that uh, will carry out the general plan policy. Part of that is a source of funding. So I know uh, Sean will be looking at that. The capital improvement plan looks at that. And again, we talked about that time frame for implementation, the ongoing short term, medium, and long term. And then the indicators are measures that show whether the community is achieving its goals and objectives, and those are reported in the annual progress report. Uh, one of the things when that annual progress report comes out, it usually comes out prior to the town council adopting its budget. And one thing that is important is taking a look at what's being implemented, what's not being implemented, and if funding needs to be made to implement one of the implementation measures, uh, in order to move it ahead, uh, the timing is really good to do that uh, in, in identifying that as part of your annual progress report and then uh, putting that information into the budget and, and moving forward. The land use diagram, this is your current land use diagram and it shows the various land uses that uh, are anticipated uh, within the community. Implementing documents include the specific plan, specialty plans, and in the case of uh, Loomis, you have your town center master plan and your drainage master plan. Uh, you have the zoning code with a zoning map, and you have standards, and in town of Loomis, you have construction improvement standards and land development manual. Uh, there may be guidelines, uh, and as we do the general plan update, uh, you're going to take a look at that and see if you want design guidelines or other guidelines that will help guide development in the town. And then you have the uh, California Environmental Quality Act, which is a disclosure document uh, that goes along with a project, a project review in the town. The zoning code implements the general plan uh, policies and it uh, prescribes with more detail allowable land uses and development standards, including the building uses, the building size, which includes the height, block coverage, and setbacks, 
parking requirements and other performance standards. Um, a question came up from one of the committees just recently that there is an area of town where the zones established do not, uh, are not consistent with the general plan. Uh, and to be clear, the gen if, if the zones are not consistent, the general plan rules. Uh, and typically within a, a project, if you have a zone that is not consistent, uh, if a project comes forward, you're going to have to then update the zoning code so that the code is in fact consistent uh, with the um, with the land use uh, standards of the land use um, diagram uh, that is proposed. Uh, as you saw, there's a new project that has just come forward that is coming under uh, SB 330. Uh, and in that case, uh, the only requirement is you comply with the uh, general plan land use designations, not the zoning. Um, Andreas is currently looking at SB 30 and will 330 and will be reporting back to uh, the town, the planning commission, and the council on exactly what that means and how the project will be processed since we have that situation currently. Uh, Christy, if you would go through the Environmental Quality Act, let me know when you want to change the slides and I will do that. Perfect. So the California Environmental Quality Act, also known as CEQA, uh, is your friend. Uh, it might not seem like it when you have a two inch thick document sitting in front of you waiting to be read, but it is your friend. It is a tool that you will use to make your informed decisions. So it's an informational and disclosure document. Uh, it analyzes the potential effects, trade-offs, and mitigation when you're considering the project. So the CEQA document should identify potential impacts and where possible mitigation measures if needed that the city or the applicant can apply to prevent or eliminate an impact. Uh, it's a disclosure document. So it is, it is disclosing the conditions that are existing as well as any future conditions that would occur with the project. It's not a legislative document. So it is, it's a decision-making tool. Um, it does not prohibit a jurisdiction from adopting a project um, when uh, that has significant impacts and unavoidable impacts when findings and a statement of overriding considerations are made. So even if a project has um, impacts that can't be mitigated, it does not mean that the CEQA document cannot be certified and it doesn't mean that the project cannot be approved. Um, it just means that those significant and un unavoidable impacts need to be thoroughly discussed, discussed and disclosed um, before any decisions are made. Next slide, please. So the CEQA document um, content and functions, um, there are different levels of CEQA documents, but overall they should describe the project. So give you a project description um, as well as a purpose and need for that project. Um, describe the existing conditions, um, which would be a setting section of the document. It's describing what is there now, and it could be site specific, and it also can um, go out to the existing conditions further from the site. Um, so looking at traffic conditions, for example, or air that's uh, not uh, limited to one square parcel. Um, it identifies the environmental impacts. Um, not all projects have environmental impacts and that's disclosed as well. So if there are no impacts, it'll tell you what, what is and wasn't, what is not an impact. Um, and the document can also serve to avoid impacts. Um, and that would usually be done by uh, changing a component of the project or a layout of the project to avoid a resource, for example, um, or reducing uh, the impact um, through mitigation measures. So there are actions that can be taken to mitigate an impact or reduce the effects of the impact to a, to a level that is considered less than significant. So it's below the threshold level. Um, and the document identifies environmental impacts that cannot be avoided or mitigated. And those were the significant and unavoidable uh, impacts I just mentioned. Um, the CEQA document also fosters intergovernmental cooperation. So Oftentimes there are there may be an impact and it might involve an agency. Um, for example, 
there might be an air impact and the Placer County Air Pollution Control District might want to have a say on that. And it's a good way to sit down with them and come to some uh, conclusions and ways to uh, reach consensus on a project. Um, so it, it can be many different agencies or groups of people, um, organizations, and it's a, it's a great way to get input. And um, CEQA also enhances the public participation process in decision-making. So it, it offers additional ways for the public to get involved so they can read through the document during the circulation period and submit comment. They can participate in a public hearing and it, it allows you to get their feedback and their input before you go ahead and make a decision on a project. Next slide, please. So there are different levels of CEQA documents or intensities. So at the, the lowest level or less intense is the categorical exemption. Um, a categorical exemption can be applied to minor changes that don't trigger environmental review. And there are 33 classes of <laughs> exemptions. Um, and, and what you will find for the most part is it's small projects, um, things like a, a house or a small commercial development um, an addition or uh, emergency action to repair something that those would all fall under a categorical exemption. Um, housing, certain types of housing can also fall under this. So affordable housing, farm worker housing, um, it, if they meet certain criteria can also fall under this exemption. Um, and a, a key item to qualify for an exemption is the site cannot have um, sensitive resources or um, hazardous uh, materials or, or things of that nature on a site. So there are limitations to mm -hmm. when you can apply a categorical exemption. Uh, the next level up is the initial study. And that is um, a document often known as a checklist. So it's the CEQA checklist. It determines whether the project can have a significant effect on the environment. And there are different uh, categories or topic areas that the checklist um, covers. So anything from aesthetics to circulation, land use, population and housing, uh, biological resources, cultural resources, wildfire, um, all sorts of environmental topics. And each item has its own set of questions and checklist items. And um, each uh, category or each question per topic area is uh, looked at in terms of whether there is no impact, uh, less than significant impact, a significant impact or a mitigable impact. Um, and the initial study will be accompanied by either a negative declaration, which is uh, when the project would have no significant effect on the environment or a mitigated negative declaration. Um, so if there is a, an impact that can be mitigated, then uh, there's a section uh, findings where um, the lead agency can, can then say that, yes, there were impacts, but um, they can be mitigated to a less than significant level. These documents will have uh, basic settings and uh, project information, uh, project description, uh, as well as a checklist, but they don't go into quite the detail that the environmental impact report or EIR will go into. And that is kind of the, the, the big, hefty document you might find once in a while in front of you. Um, so if the initial study finds one or more potentially significant impact that cannot be avoided or mitigated or requires some additional attention, then an environmental impact report will be prepared. And this document goes a little further than the initial study in that the setting is usually more in depth. There's more um, detail that is presented, uh, there are required alternatives. So that would include a no project and then any feasible alternative that meets the purpose of the project and can mitigate or reduce an impact. Those need to be considered. Um, cumulative impacts of the project with other projects would also be considered in an environmental impact report. And then the EIR has a longer circulation period, a public review period um, due to its size. It allows for reviewers to have a little extra time before they need to submit comments on, on a document. And throughout, 
throughout all these processes, um, the public can participate through that circulation period and then also through public hearings. And their input as well as the information in the documents will help you reach informed decisions um, as you are reviewing projects. One of the documents not listed in here, but if an environmental impact report is required based on the initial study, uh, then scoping is required, which is another opportunity for the public to have input on what environmental topics uh, should be discussed in the environmental impact report. Um, so we'll have to update our slides, Christy, to, to show that. <laughs> yes. All right. So what is the role of the planning commission? Um, and uh, just a little background on myself. I've been in, this is my 50th year doing planning, but I've now been on the Placer County Planning Commission for three years. So uh, I've experienced both sides of the deal and the roles are, are kind of interesting. So first of all, it's a creation process. Um, the Planning Commission participates in the development of the general plan, the housing element, and the zoning code in providing recommendations to the City Council on what should be adopted. The Planning Commission at their hearings or workshops also facilitates community engagement in this process. And uh, they may also conduct study sessions or other forums to get public input into this process. And so in this process that we're going to right now with your general plan, uh, we have the committees. Uh, there is a commissioner on every committee. Uh, there is a council member on every committee and those committees make the recommendations to the planning commission and the planning commission will make their recommendations to the city council. The planning commission is appointed by the town council. Uh, the commission itself is not the policy body, that is the council's role. But the planning commission does make recommendations to the council on policy, the general plan elements, specific plans or other specialized plans, the zoning code and implementation measures. So you are advisors to the council uh, on all of these matters. Also in its quasi judicial action, there are project approvals that the planning commission will go through. And that includes site plan, architectural review, conditional use permits, tentative maps, uh, et cetera. So it's not just a policy body, but you actually are making decisions. In some cases, those decisions end with the planning commission uh, with the ability to uh, appeal those to the council. In other cases, uh, those, rec those are recommendations to the council for their approval. The, world, the planning commission is to assure that the projects, the zoning code, the general, all of the uh, codes and ordinances and guidelines are consistent with the general plan. And that is a primary role of the planning commission is to review those documents and um, review it in light of the general plan and make sure that you're consistent. Uh, the Planning Commission also has a role of conducting public hearings, uh, both on projects and on the general plan process. Some of the commissioner traits that I think are important is, you know, your community. Uh, who better to make recommendations than someone who lives in the community and knows the community? Uh, you also have personal expertise, having lived in the community, on how to address issues. You need to be open-minded and listen to new ideas um, that may or you know that that may be useful in the community, but consider those ideas because sometimes uh, crazy ideas actually work out well in a community. You need to be able to see the strengths and weaknesses of all the proposals and balance those proposals before you. Part of that process may be recommendations to the applicant to make modifications to their project to make them a better project. You need critical thinking skills leading uh, toward finding the solutions when working with others. And that includes other commissioners, the applicant and the community or other agencies. You need to spend time uh, to study the materials and you need to attend the meetings regularly. Uh, it is difficult to get these materials and read through them. Uh, over time, I think uh, as Jean knows after 20 years, you know how to review those and go quickly through the materials and, and you know what to look for. It's also, you need to be committed to making the process fair for all. 
uh, and consistent for all. And you also have to have faith in the future and the ability of the community to shape that future. One of the early lessons I learned in my career is I had ideas about planning, but I found planning commissions had other ideas. And in the long term, their ideas were better than mine. So you have to listen uh, because there's a lot of good ideas out there. And the, the planning commissioners know their community probably better than anyone else. And then it's really important to articulate the reasons for your decision and especially to articulate those to the council so the council understands uh, how you came to the decisions and why you made the decisions. How do, you, how do you deal with all this information? So you need to read the staff report, definitely. You need to read the environmental documentation. You need to read the uh, mitigation monitoring program. My recommendation is you uh, view the project online through uh, Google Maps. And if you can, I would recommend visiting the site because there's nothing like seeing the site to understand uh, the relationship of the site to its neighbors. Read all the comments that come in and read them openly and try to understand what those comments are saying because a lot of times comments will be made that may not hit to the real reason the comment is being made. So you have to do some interpretation uh, at times to understand what's being said. It's also helpful to research prior projects. And this is where I found Jean helpful to me is because she knew prior projects and could give examples of how the planning commission or the town council address those issues. And that's helpful in looking at projects currently before you. Understanding the findings, and these are the findings Christy was talking about uh, that have to be made when you adopt the project. And some of those findings are that the project is consistent with the general plan. And it's important to have meetings with your staff ask your staff questions, uh, have a discussion with them about the project. It's important at times to have a discussion with the applicant. It doesn't mean you're making a decision, but hearing what their point of view is. Uh, also meet with stakeholders, people who live in the community or have a stake in the project. And it's also important to listen to the community and have meetings with those. Uh, as appropriate means, you don't wanna get into an issue of making decisions prior to uh, the meeting but it's to listen and better understand the project. And then it's also important to listen attentively at the meetings to what is being said, both by the other commissioners and also by the community as they make their presentation. What are the questions the commissioner asks as, as you go through projects? And the question that is, is the project, the proposal and compliant and consistent with the general plan? Is the proposal in compliance is consistent with the code of ordinances and that could be the zoning code uh, the subdivision code or other codes does the environmental documentation disclose the impacts fully you know is there an impact that wasn't disclosed think about that is the analysis in the environmental document and in the staff report objective thorough and correct if you have disagreements those should be brought forward and discussed uh, if you read the staff report or the environmental document before a hearing, please call your staff and let them know so they can be ready to address those at the planning commission hearing. Do the mitigation measures work to actually mitigate the impacts that have been identified in the environmental document? Are there other mitigation measures that might work better that should be considered? And are the mitigation measures flexible enough to adjust to changing conditions? And, you know, we're experiencing that at the staff level right now that conditions have changed in Loomis, uh, both, uh, and, and were the mitigation measures adopted years ago still applicable today? And I believe Mary Beth has recently come forward to you with a change in one condition to be more reflective of uh, today's circumstances. And then, how are the mitigation measures going to be enforced? Because if they're not enforced, if they're not implemented, they do no good. And then always think what's best for the community as you uh, look at your projects. And that's probably one of the highest things. And, and that goes back to, is it consistent with the general plan? The commissioner's perspective is you have that local knowledge. Um, I had experience once where we were trying to figure out where the, the flood zone was and the FEMA maps were not correct. 
and a commissioner said, well, come with me. And he, we went out and he said, the floodwaters got here. Here's a, a watermark on, on the edge of the road. And uh, we were able to actually remap the floodwaters. And, you know, there's all kinds of local knowledge that the commission has and the community has uh, that is very helpful uh, in putting together the setting sections for the general plan or for your environmental documents uh, or as you discuss the existing conditions in project review. You also have knowledge of prior decisions and it's important to be consistent in the decisions you make on projects. And if you decide to change a decision, it's important then to document why did you change that decision? What were the circumstances that caused you to say, yes, we made this decision five years ago, but we're making this decision today because of the following circumstances. And that could be new regulation, it could be uh, changing environmental conditions, there could be a, a number of things, but document those decisions and be consistent with all of your decisions. And then also look for approaches that work uh, in uh, implementing projects in the town. And then also it's important as a commission to identify when a policy or approach needs to change. And that could be because of changes in technology, economics, politics, or culture. I know as I sit on the commission, if a variance comes forward, my feeling is why do we have a variance? If we need a variance, should we go in and change the code so we don't have to deal with the variance anymore? Is it important that everybody be treated equally? Um, and so it's important if you see that a policy uh, or a code needs to be changed to make that recommendation to the staff and to the uh, city council. And then the other thing is just have confidence in your decision. You've been around um, and, and feel confident after going through all these processes that, that you've made the right decision uh, and, and move forward from there. It's important that you work with the staff. Uh, they become a resource of knowledge uh, from a technical policy process history standpoint. They're a resource to identify potential solutions and options for solutions. Uh, they're a resource to help you understand what those options are and the consequences. If you make a decision, what are the consequences of making that decision? It's important to alert the staff to any changes or concerns ahead of time so they can be addressed and that uh, good decisions can be made at the uh, planning commission meeting. Um, and also if you have requests that you want the staff to include, get the to the staff early enough so they can put it in the staff report and in their presentation and address your concerns up front. Um, and also let the staff know when there, there should be considerations uh, in modifications to the general plan or code uh, when you feel it's appropriate. And then always provide staff with clear and concise requests and direction. Let me tell you, the staff appreciates that so much. And, Gene, you were one of the persons who gave staff very clear direction and, and it was appreciated. Working with the community, the local citizens have an unbelievable resource of knowledge. It's undocumented local knowledge and history of, as we've been putting the settings together. We learned history that we had no idea about and it. it's absolutely fascinating and wonderful. During the open house events, we were told information uh, that is now being included in the setting section that we had no, no idea was out there. Uh, also, the community has eyes for, uh, ideas for practical implementation. You know, as residents or business persons, they're out there having to live with the codes and ordinances every day, and they have good ideas for how to make that work in, in the town of Lewis. And they also have an understanding of the practical practical issues uh, when uh, facing a, a new code or an ordinance uh, or a mitigation measure and can work with the planning commission in coming up with good solutions. The commissioners are also educators uh, on letting the community know how the process works, uh, how the community can comment effectively uh, to the commission and on what points are important in the decision process. Uh, Often um, people are coming forward to you um, and they're emotional about the decisions that are being considered. And it's important to let them know that as a commission, you're looking at consistent 
see with the general plan, with the codes and the ordinances. And there are times that you have to take the emotion out of the process and just making decisions based on the code, ordinances, and plan. And also, uh, if you listen and observe, you're going to identify the real issues. And so, Bonnie, a little bit earlier, I talked about the committees kind of going roundabout a bit. We're listening and we're observing, and those issues and the real issues and the real vision will come out of that process. But it, it's kind of like making sausage. Sometimes it's a little messy to get there, but we will get there. And then also, it's important to talk with the community about options that work in the community, some different things that may work, uh, just to kind of test them uh, with the community. It's also important that you work with each other because you're a resource for the past decisions. You're a resource for the history of the policy direction that has been taken. Uh, and while you can test ideas, you have to be mindful of the Brown Act. And I know Andreas is going to be talking to you more about the Brown Act. Uh, one of the things I just became aware of is as a commissioner, I'm not allowed to uh, comment on other commissioners' sites about projects uh, on Facebook or Twitter, whatever. So uh, that's fairly new uh, legal decisions. And I know Andreas is going to be advising us all on uh, how we should deal with social media. And it's also important that you work with the elected officials, the council members that appointed you and other council members to understand their policy and what are the drivers in their decisions and to discuss ideas and options that will work in the community with them and bring those back to the planning commission. And then make sure you communicate with the council members on how the decisions were made on major issues so that they understand and you can have that discussion with the council and then have the staff keep you appraised of the decisions by council, which I believe Mary Beth does. Uh, so you understand how they took your recommendations and applied those recommendations to the projects. So that is the um, presentation. I wanted to acknowledge the, the California cities and the uh, slides that were prepared by David Early and Mark Roberts in this presentation. So be glad to, Christy and I would be glad to answer questions. Are there any panelists that have any questions? That would be my planning commissioners. You know, I, I didn't have any specific questions, but I, uh, I liked the entire presentation. It was excellent. I specifically liked the section, uh, the last section, number three, about the uh, roles of the planning commissioner. Uh, I think it's really uh, important and it raises a lot of points. And I think just because, you know, a lot of our, us have been on the commission for quite a while, there's some points there that kind of stood out to me as personally, because I'm not saying for the whole commission, as uh, areas that I could maybe work on a little bit and kind of pointed me in a, uh, highlighted some directions that maybe I need to go. So I just, uh, you know, want to thank you for that. You're welcome. Yeah. And now the other thing I, I that did kind of pique my curiosity when you're talking about planning commissioners and talking to your council member and this, that, and the other. And it's just that we've been so sensitized about not talking to anybody anymore. I think it's kind of a, a pendulum going on here where you know you go from talking too much to maybe not talking enough. And I kind of think we're in a not talking enough uh, situation right now. And I don't know other people can kind of chime in and see if they agree or disagree, but um, you know, you have to talk to people. <laughs> and uh, I realize you can't, you know, talk to three planning commissioners, you know, things like that. But uh, you know, and then even with uh, members of the community, sometimes I get conflicting uh, thoughts here on different things I read on the on the slides and that about, you know, talking to your uh, community members as a planning commissioner, but then you, you get kind of this thing called ex parte communication. And, and that's kind of a dilemma. And that's a dilemma right now I, I'm struggling with, and I know other planning commissioners are. And if you have any thoughts on that, and that would be something maybe the lawyers can kind of help us a little bit because I don't want to see the commission hamstrung um, from communication. 
I think um, well, Andreas is going to be making a presentation on the Brown Act. Um, and I, I think Andreas, I see you're on the line. So, um, you know, especially when you make your presentation talk about how the commissioners can talk to others. My own experience when I've been asked to go out and talk to the community about projects um, is one, not to say what the decision is that I right. make, but one to inquire of them, what are the issues? So I know uh, I spent a lot of time with people on Hidden Falls and, and some of the landowners around there and just questioning what's the issue and then try to talk back to them saying, this is your issue and maybe here's some solutions and here are the things you may not want to be focusing on your comments that relate to how the decision will be made. Mm -hmm. um, but it's really listening and then part of the role as an educator kind of letting them know, you know, we're not making decisions on emotion, but we're making decisions on consistency and compliance with the codes, the plans, the ordinances, um, and, and look at, so that's where you become an educator uh, to the community. But it really is for you to listen, to understand what their issues are, so you can then put that from what they're saying uh, into kind of a planning commissioner's mindset of, how does this apply to the goals, objectives, general plan, codes, ordinances uh, in your decision making? Yeah, I think that that's a good point is to focus on what the issues are. And, and certainly, and this is for everybody, you, you don't want to tip off, you know, how you think you might be voting. And, and hopefully we all go into it without any preconceived ideas about how we are going to vote. I like to, I like to say that I'm not going to, I haven't made up my mind until you know, the next to the last meeting or the last meeting. Um, yeah. But that's a, I think that's a good way to put it. You know, one other thing I found is helpful is saying, what's good about the project? What do you like? What wouldn't you change? So that you, you kind of put those things to the side saying, okay, that's not the issue, you know, and narrow down the issues that you're thinking about. But sometimes that also stimulates discussion uh, in the community about what they're really thinking. So it's a technique that I, I find helpful. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, excuse me. We had, um, for that last conversation, our deputy town attorney, Andreas Buer, would like to comment. <laughs> but if, if I can just fill in for a second, some of the, the stuff that we'll be covering in more detail in the Brown Act presentation in a few weeks. You are, as commissioners, allowed to speak with members of the community. Now, there, there might be certain circumstances where you'll have to disclose that ex parte communication if it, if it pertains to a specific item before you. But in general, the Brown Act doesn't prohibit you as commissioners from speaking to members of the public. And so if, if that's a concern that's been going about our, our planning commission, I, I apologize for not clarifying that point sooner. And I, I would encourage you to, to learn about the community's concerns by speaking with members of the community. So, so what is the ex parte communication? Uh, because that seems there's an implication by that term that you, that you just ran afoul of some law. So, and I, I guess I still don't quite. So what, if, you, what... if you were to have a certain item before you and you go speak with the applicant about that, that item, before a meeting, before you render a decision on that item. In that case, we'd ask you to disclose that conversation at the meeting because okay. you had an ex parte communication about the item before you. Well, that's so, most of the time, that's the majority of the time we would talk to the person uh, from the community or they, they reach out to us uh, actually more often. And, uh, and that would be on an item that's, that is before us. They're not yes. talking in general, they're talking about an item. So, and so in that okay case, to... we need you to disclose that at the start of the meeting and kind of summarize the general conversation you had about the item. Okay. So it's fine to have the conversation. You just need to disclose it. Yes. Okay. That, that's, that's good. I, I, get, I get that. Thank you. And without getting too much into the weeds about serial meetings and the Brown Act here, yeah. you obviously wouldn't get to discuss with them if they've already had conversations with a number of your other planning commissioners, how those other planning commissioners reacted to those conversations. So that's where it gets a little bit tricky and you yeah. need to be really careful about what the subject matter of those conversations veers into. 
Yeah, well, you may not know that they've talked to other planning commissioners. Yes, but the, the problem would arise if they tell you, oh, I, I talked to Commissioner London and, I, <laughs> and she yeah. thought it was a really great idea. So yeah. uh, Commissioner Hogan yeah. seemed a little on the fence, but how do you feel about this? So it's okay. just that yeah, consensus I, I, building I, where the Brown Act really starts to come into play. But yeah. we'll get into more detail on that in a, in a few weeks. Great. Okay, looking forward. Thank you. Good. Does anybody else? So I think that's the end of our Bonnie, presentation. Now, Bonnie Thanks. London has uh, her hand raised, and you're welcome to unmute. Thank you. Um, yes, no, thank you, Andy. I really appreciated the presentation, um, you know, and especially the, the part about our role um, as listening to our community so that we can represent their interests, their needs, better understand them, um, and also help educate them. Um, you know, I guess, you know, my big concern is that, you know, the entire year we've now celebrated, you know, a whole year of, you know, having to, you know, be living through this pandemic, which has really made, um, you know, community outreach and engagement difficult. It's, it's, you know, been hard to do these Zoom meetings and, and even being able to, um, you know, to have kind of rich discussions. And so, um, you know, I guess that's my concern about, you um, you know, with the, the general plan update, I know that um, the housing element is kind of a hard fixed date on when we need to submit that and get that in. Um, but in terms of, you know, being able to truly understand the needs of this community, which has changed in, you know, 20 years since the last time that it was done. And from my understanding, um, the outreach and engagement was, you know, was really robust because it wasn't, um, you know, during a pandemic. Um, you know, if that's just, uh, you know, something to also consider, or if you have suggestions on what we can do, um, you know, with, with the, the practical aspects that we have of not being able to, you know, to be able to meet in large public gatherings, uh, the way that we had before. I guess recommendation, recommendation, Bonnie, is, you know, um, reach out to the community, um, you know, where we can uh, on an individual basis to listen and understand. Um, one of the things we're working on right now is uh, the committee's council and planning commission are going to, there's a lot of comments that we've received and we're responding to all those comments and those will come out on a monthly basis. So you can begin reviewing those monthly reports on the comments, how they were addressed. Uh, in this general plan process, and that might help also in beginning to see a comprehensive picture of the the issues or the the vision uh, that is being developed. So hopefully that will be helpful to you. Excuse me, I have one more uh, comment in the chat from Council Member Nisley. She asked me to read this uh, in the presentation under general plan indicators of meeting our general plan goals, how does that yearly report that we are meeting the goals get generated? <laughs> Geez, Mary Beth, you write that one. So yep. <laughs> <laughs> I'm working on it. <laughs> <laughs> um, the annual progress report when it began really focused on things like, um, what did you do this year? So in the report would be, you know, we held committee meetings on the, the rural main street program and had Michelle's meeting. But in the last year or so, as both Mary Beth and Christy will attest to, the Office of Housing Community Development has almost uh, corralled that process. And the spreadsheets that they have you fill out on what housing went where, did you achieve this or not achieve that is extensive. So uh, information comes from the building report, information comes from the planning commission, city council decisions uh, about each step of the process and, and how it was implemented. Now, the, the good thing is this year was a bad year because all these new tables came out that had to be filled out and it was quite cumbersome to, to complete. But you update that report every year. So it's not as if you're reinventing the whole wheel uh, every year, but you update that report. And I believe Mary Beth, those annual progress reports are on uh, the city's websites to review. Um, I believe so. The, the last two years I've done, so this 
will be my third year in completing that report. And did you complete the 2020 progress report? It, it's in progress. It's in progress. Okay, so look forward. <laughs> the for that. timeline is shrinking. Yeah. <laughs> Understood. But uh, again, this year, uh, HCD, it was unbelievable um, the minutia that they have asked for that we're reporting on. So we'll get there. We'll get there. One thing they are asking to report on is if projects have been rejected, a reason why. Um, it's specifically for housing. So uh, it's one thing to keep in mind that they are asking that question now. Okay. All right. Uh, we, did, we didn't officially open this up yet to public comment. So uh, we'll go ahead and do that. If there's anybody out there that uh, wants to ask a question, have some input to this. Uh, Mary Beth, does anybody have their hands up? Yes, Jean Wilson, you may unmute and speak. Okay, did I unmute? Yes. Yes, you're good, Jean. Um, this is a question on on um, excellent presentation. I'm, I learned a whole lot too. Um, <laughs> there you go. Uh, it was on communicating your decisions to the council. Now we don't. We often don't, don't, we just make our decision and it doesn't go to the council, but when they do, I don't know that we have specifically worked at that. And that might be a helpful thing. I can recall in the way back in the past, a couple of times when there were appeals and we basically, I was the person that got selected to go and give our position. But other than that, I don't know that we have done that. So what are some of the ways that uh, planning commission can and uh, can communicate that to council. You, and I, I'm just going from my personal experience um, during the discussion uh, of the commission prior to making a decision. Uh, I know uh, on our commission, I will kind of state this is what I heard. Uh, this is how I'm coming to the conclusion. Uh, and other commissioners do the same thing. And we kind of go to each of the commissioners for that. Um, also, at times after the decision is made, I will talk directly to the staff saying, you know, this is coming up on a regular basis. We really do need to take a look at modifying our code of ordinances to address this issue. And I know in the case of Placer County staff, uh, the new housing code uh, is addressing some of those issues that uh, we brought up. One of those uh, especially for a wild, wild land interface is no wooden structures next to the house. They'd be at least five feet apart. And I believe that is now going to be part of the code uh, for the county. So talk, talk about it prior to the decision. Then after the decision, uh, the chair or others on the commission can be very specific about making recommendations to the council. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, Jean. Uh, any other uh, comments out there, Mary Beth? No, sir. We are clear. Okay. All right. I, does anybody else have anything else? Otherwise, we'll kind of move along. Other than if I could, uh, Councilwoman Nisley um, said thank you for your time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we, I, we, all, we all thank you. Yep. It was very good. Very, very that was good. enjoyable. Yeah. Okay, so we'll close public comment. The next is a uh, planning director's report. Yes, good uh, evening. <laughs> um, welcome, you know, outgoing, not welcome, outgoing <laughs> member Wilson, but, you know, she's still going to be incoming, so I look forward to that. Um, but welcome to Stephanie Youngblood for uh, her first meeting. So I'll do a quick little update on all the stuff happening in the planning department. Uh, the general plan update, we've talked about that a few times, uh, but as you know, the committees were seated and regular monthly committee and subcommittee meetings began a couple of weeks ago in the middle of March. And by mid April, each committee will have completed their first meeting. A total of 16 committees with nine members each and three to four meetings each week, all conducted via Zoom. 
our website updates are ongoing, continuous, ever-changing, and we can't quite keep up, but we're getting there. We're, we're finally getting a little rhythm going. <laughs> our housing survey, this, this goes to the Housing Element Committee. Uh, PlaceWorks hosted a housing survey that we posted uh, not only on our website, but on our Facebook page. That was posted, it, it was posted, it began on March 3rd, and it expired on March 22nd. Uh, so PlaceWorks will be compiling the results and those comments will be forwarded to the housing committee uh, for their review consideration and all of that. Um, from the town's Facebook page and people that we reached, we reached 719 people and we had 63 engagements. On Friday, or I should say as of Friday, PlaceWorks reported 250 re responses to the survey with 197 complete responses. So only the complete responses will be considered and forwarded with the survey uh, uh, final round. Along with our general plan update, we're um, just launching a social pinpoint program that's gonna tie directly into our general plan where it, it's more of an interactive mapping tool, but each element will have its own map and setting. And, and we're gonna kind of shift from the website to this social pinpoint platform as a way to allow public engagement on a real easy level. Uh, our staff member, Sarah Day, has been creating the design studio at the landing pages, including the maps. Um, that people will use during that public participation. Uh, the social pinpoint program will also allow us the opportunity to host our own surveys on any topic, whether it's general plan related or street surveys or you name it, we'll, we'll have control over that. Whereas the survey on housing was uh, put together and sponsored by PlaceWorks as part of their contract. This is an opportunity for us to create our own at any point in time. So I, I believe I, I have my fingers crossed. Um, we're going to be able to start launching this social pinpoint platform within the next two to three weeks. I'd like to say it would be next week, but I know <laughs> how things work and I'd rather give myself another week or so just to make sure we've worked out the bugs. Uh, miscellaneous projects. At your last planning commission meeting, the uh, planning commission approved the ACE hardware annex uh, with the condition that it returned back to an ad hoc committee and your planning director for approval prior to construction. We are still waiting for receipt of a site plan and the things that we need to look at in order to make that determination. So uh, ACE hardware, Greg Brenning is putting that information together and as soon as he's ready. I know he's gonna to wanna to roll. Uh, so we're just waiting for receipt of his documentation to move that going forward. We received an application for Loomis RV Campground. Uh, this is at 5847 Brace Road. So as you're on the freeway, it's on the east side of the freeway as you go under the Brace Road undercrossing. So just off of Brace, but on the other side of the freeway. Uh, the proposal is for 37, uh, a 37 space RV campground, no mobile homes, uh, month to month occupancy, but they will not offer permanent or yearly sites. So we just received that application in and it's currently under staff review. Uh, Christy's doing the, the heavy lifting on that one to start with and we'll take it from there. Uh, we received an application for a modification to an existing use permit at the Homewood Lumber site. And the um, new business coming in there is Kniesel's Auto Body. So it'll change from Homewood Lumber to being an auto body shop. Um, and again, vehicle services, major repair, body work is an allowable use within the, the general commercial zoning district. Uh, as long as they get that use permit approval. So we will be taking and dusting off the existing use permit for the Homewood site 
and amending it and modifying it to fit with this particular business. Uh, so again, this application just came in currently under review. Staff will work with the applicants and we'll get it back to Planning Commission for approval. Um, I would say at your next meeting in April. Uh, Andy kind of touched on the pre-application submittal by Hidden Grove. Uh, so all we know at this point is what their application is. We posted it on our website. And at this point, we kind of know as much as everybody else knows. So again, another application that's going to have to uh, undertake some serious review. And staff needs to work out those logistics. So lots of big things going on here. <laughs> kind yeah. of crazy. <laughs> A um, couple of just little miscellaneous odds and ends. Um, even though COVID is reducing, uh, Town Hall continues public counter hours Monday through Thursday from 9 a.m. to noon. Staff is slowly working back to um, working more full time. Everybody's getting vaccinated and pretty soon we won't even have to wear our masks in the office because everybody will be vaccinated. So yay staff. The Loomis Library is now open to the public on a limited in-person occupancy rate. So they're monitoring the number of people in the building as they come. I think their maximum is about 10. Uh, so I just refer you to check the Loomis Library website for any updates in their current uh, schedule they have going on. And then lastly, our next Planning Commission regular meeting is scheduled for April 27th, 2021. And in between now and then, we'll have our first round of committee meetings wrapped up. So then it'll be on to the second round. So um, I'm happy to answer any questions you have. And go from there. Yeah, yeah I, I'm kind of curious. Do we have to get down into the next lower tier before we can start having public meetings? Or do you know which tier we have to be in? Uh, Carol, do you have any I, I kind of keep track, but my counties are confused. I think we have to drop one more level. But one more at staff level. meeting, yeah, at staff meeting today, Sean was talking about perhaps, um, you know, he totally drives our COVID bus. So um, he was thinking perhaps beginning in April, we would return to planning commission and council meetings at the depot. Great. I know okay. that with all these committee meetings, they will remain as um, Zoom. Zoom, yes. Okay. And we right. and we will be having to at least be in the orange, which is at least the next tier, if not the one following that. So we don't know about April yet. Okay. All right. Thank you. We're getting there. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So uh, there's no other questions of Mary Beth. No, doesn't seem like it. So. We'll go on next is uh, commission reports. The planning commissioners have anything to bring forth uh, items that weren't on the agenda? Okay, uh, seeing nothing there. All right, then um, I think we'll, we'll adjourn the meeting. Thank you, everybody. See you next month. Thank you, Gene. Bye, <laughs> Bye Gene. Bye, thank you. All right, yeah, nice flowers. <laughs> Pretty thank, you, thank you. Thank you for that. You're very welcome, Jean. We'll be seeing you. <laughs> okay. Tomorrow. Meeting tomorrow. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Good night. Good night.